Well, this already feels like an old story, but it was just yesterday, um, or maybe it was late the day before, that we found out that uh, the DNC and affiliated groups, according to Politico, are trying to work with uh, cell phone carriers to uh, stamp out misinformation uh, over um, sh you know, short message services. I believe that's what SMS stands for. Uh, text messages is what they're talking about. Um, they are trying to make sure that um, text messages become as censored as social media to where wrong think and uh, what's the term, sedition, <laughs> Uh, is not tolerated. Now, currently, text messages are considered to be private communications, you know, from one person to another. But of course, you have the uh, you have the phone company acting as an intermediary, and the phone company, as we learned a few years ago, specifically AT and T, but this is going to be true for all the major carriers. But AT and T is the one where we got a big leak about. Um, and because of what we know about AT and T, we then can extrapolate that to the rest of the um, uh, of US-based phone carriers, the NSA has a backdoor uh, into uh, sort of the main, uh, uh, the main spinal cord of AT&T. And so every, all the communications that flow through AT&T can get siphoned off to the NSA. And at that point, when we heard that story, uh, the government was not using that backdoor, was not using that, um, their relationship with AT&T in order to stifle free speech. It was sort of an implicit threat. Um, it was, it was saying, yeah, okay, they know everything. They, they, or the, I shouldn't say they know everything. They have the ability to access everyone's personal communications, uh, from person to person. The government um, can view that and obviously through their relationship with the telecom companies um, can influence that, but they haven't exercised any sort of power. Uh, they haven't really put that, um, uh, that relationship, uh, they haven't leveraged it to its full potential. But uh, many of us, uh, you know, us crackpots on the internet said, gee, well, just it's only a matter of time. Uh, if the government already has a backdoor in, you know, and is siphoning off um, uh, our communications, they're going to do something with that power at some point. And now it looks like what they are uh, choosing to do, um, and again, this is sort of a trial balloon kind of story. It hasn't happened yet that we know of, I don't think, um, but we will probably see more of this in, into the future, is they're going to uh, use that backdoor into... Uh, our communication, specifically our text messages, to uh, screen them, <laughs> run them through a government filter, and block anything uh, that uh, that doesn't uh, uh, mesh with the state narrative. This is essentially a modern um, office of censorship. This is equivalent to the government censors opening everybody's mail, reading every letter, and you know drawing a black line through anything that was in a letter that the government thought was subversive or jeopardized you know, uh, any vague notion of national security. And I've argued that they've been doing this for quite a while on social media. I think that it's uh, an odd coincidence that the kinds of things that get you banned on social media uh, just happen to be things that uh, upset uh, you know, the establishment and uh, the national security state. And now uh, the state is looking uh, to apply that same kind of censorship uh, to our text messages. And make no mistake, they should be able to do it as easily as the social media companies do. They can start by just blacklisting uh, certain words. Uh, they could, uh, you know, have algorithms that just try and, you know, filter out uh, any texts that they don't like. I mean, I think it would be probably a pretty simple thing to train an algorithm to do. And then all of a sudden, um, people can't send uh, seditious or subversive communications back and forth. The state will say, well, this is necessary in order to combat, you know, domestic terrorism and domestic violent extremists. We must censor violent extremists. Why are you upset about this if, unless you are yourself a violent extremist, uh, spreading violent extremist ideology? Uh, you should have no opposition to this. 
after all, as Nancy Pelosi says, the Supreme Court ruled, uh, you know, the First Amendment does not give you the right to shout wolf in a crowded theater. Why would it give you the right to say that certain medical um, uh, drugs, which are not FDA approved, but are promoted endlessly uh, by Fauci and Biden and Trump alike? Um, I think you know what drugs I'm talking about. You shouldn't be allowed to say that those drugs don't work or that those drugs are dangerous. And all they have to do is, is say that, you know, hey, this is just like shouting wolf in a crowded theater. Even though, if I recall, that specific decision that is always cited uh, by folks like Nancy Pelosi um, actually has been since overturned by the Supreme Court. And I think now the relevant case would be Brandenburg v. Ohio, um, which is a, a, a which you know has a pretty high standard um, for you know for what is considered free speech. You know, under that decision, uh, it's very difficult for uh, the government to censor people. But that's why the government is able to get a, you know is is trying to get get away with this by using cutouts uh, like. Twitter, Facebook, uh, AT&T, Verizon, uh, any of these, uh, uh, you know, any of these communications companies. You know, it's funny. Uh, Tim Poole, in discussing this yesterday, said, uh, you know, hey, so many of us like me said that, hey, these big tech companies, they're monopolies and they should be treated like common carriers, just like the phone company. I mean, nobody would ever think the phone company would censor you. And then all of a sudden, you know, hey, here we have this happening. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> the government regulating a company does not make it less corruptible. It makes it more corruptible because uh, no matter what bad things you think a company might do in its own private capacity using its, you know, its quote unquote market power, uh, it's always going to pale in comparison to what sort of terrible things a company can do to you when it has the power of the state behind it. Uh, and remember, the folks who are in the state um, who supposedly regulate these companies um, are never people who have uh, the interests of uh, the common man or the consumer at heart. These folks, more often than not, I shouldn't even give them that much credit, almost in every case are uh, folks who are have deep ties in whatever industry it is that they are regulating. And that's why these industries lobby for the regulation. Hope that wasn't too loud. I don't have the patience to go back and edit that noise out. Something fell off a shelf. Uh, forgive me. Uh, but, uh, you know, the great old example of the, uh, the uh, what was it, the Trade Commission? Federal Trade Commission, I think it was, that was created to supposedly regulate the railroads. Well, who lobbied <laughs> in order for the FTC to be created? It was the railroads themselves. Who benefited uh, from uh, the creation of the FTC? It was the railroads. Who staffed the FTC? It was the railroads. Uh, what the FTC, uh, the you know, sort of the 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 uh, the prototypical. Uh, U.S. government agency, regulatory agency, what it did was it prevented competition in the marketplace of the railroads. Because what the railroads used to try and do is they would try and form cartels and regulate the, in themselves by setting, a, you know, a standard price and say, okay, we're all going to ship at this, you know, at this same rate and we're not going to undercut each other. And inevitably what would happen was some uh, enterprising uh, cartel member would say, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to undercut my competition because I can, uh, and I'm going to get more business that way. And they were competing, and it was beneficial to the consumer because the consumer got lower prices, but the other cartel members didn't like this. And so they created the FTC, which set standard rates and forced everyone to essentially not compete with each other. There's a great book on this topic by Gabriel Kolko called uh, Railroads and Regulation. I recommend you all read it if you still buy into um, the, you know, the neoliberal fallacy of regulated uh, capitalism. So anyway, back to the way that uh, regulated corporations um, are being used by the state to screw us over today. Uh, 
we may not get, you know, this trial balloon about the DNC reading people's text messages, and they won't literally be reading them. They will be creating algorithms uh, to scan and then flag uh, and um, censor text messages. And then, you know, you could have a th system where the person who sent that text message gets flagged and they have a real person read it and say, oh, gee, how, how seditious was this? So they say, oh, my gosh, this person is talking about... Um, uh, staging an insurrection we must go arrest this person and charge them with sedition they may you know they might be gaslighting us right now and saying hey you're crazy if you think that that can happen even though politico is reporting it but it'll happen soon enough uh just give it a couple months this stuff that's been going on with social media um that is just the first step there it's the low-hanging fruit uh you know social media uh <laughs> is not the, like it's a problem, but it's not the problem. It is a symptom of the problem. The problem is the entire elite class, uh, which controls our political and economic system. As long as you, uh, as you're in their crosshairs, as long as you're a thorn in their side, they will continue to go after you and try and destroy your life and bury you. Uh, and so, if they take, if they kick you off Twitter, and you still have access to texting people and you can you know have these big group chats or something like that and you text back and forth over sms they're going to take that out too eventually and then they'll start reading your mail or any or anyone who's on one of these subversive lists they'll just not deliver your mail and then you'll say fine i'll send letters through fedex and ups and then fedex and ups will blacklist you um because you know, they don't want to be on the bad side of the regime, so they're not going to help subversives. This is the way, the, the way that the state, uh, and I use the term state broadly. It's not literally just people whose paychecks, um, you know, are written by the U.S. Treasury. Um, it, it's folks who exercise state power, who exercise force in a um, nominally legitimate manner. They slowly... Um, put their hands around your neck and tighten their grip. And so while you slowly are trying to peel each individual finger that they have digging into your neck off, um, you know, you've got one finger that's Facebook, one finger that's Twitter, one finger that's, uh, you know, Bank of America banning your business and saying, we don't want to do business with you. You've got all these different fingers of the state that are digging into you. Um, whereas... You know, if you get one, if you peel back one finger, you've still got nine more uh, choking you out. What you need to do is you have to punch the state right in the face, and you got to get their hands off of you. And so it's always important to keep perspective and understand who your enemy is and just who it is um, that's trying to take you down. So with that said, I will see folks back here tomorrow.